well, everybody, fans of the channel will know that I am a big fan of Aston Martins, and over the last few years, I have been lucky enough to drive quite a few of them, unoriginal though they may be with their naming schemes. So there was the DB9, the DB11, the Vanquish, the Vanquish again, the DBS, and uh, the DBS, but of all the Aston Martins out there, if you were to ask me what my dream purchase, my lottery win car would be, it is in fact one that I've never ever driven. It's the V8 Vantage. No, not that one, this one. Except this isn't a V8 Vantage. It is in fact the regular entry level Aston Martin V8 full stop. The difference, well, this has a little bit less power, likely doesn't go around a bend quite as well. However, more importantly, it looks almost the same as a V8 Vantage. It will sound almost the same as a V8 Vantage. Inside, it is almost identical to a V8 Vantage. The only real difference is the fact that these are about £300,000 cheaper. So where a V8 Vantage is likely to remain the car of my dreams forevermore, this I might just about be able to turn into reality. The question I then have to answer this week is do I want to? This is a 1985 Aston Martin Series 4 V8, otherwise known as the Oscar India, and it belongs to a good friend of mine called Guy. If you think you recognise the registration plate, well, you might, because once upon a time it was attached to the car that became my Ferrari F12. Guy has been a big supporter of the channel for a number of years now, but this week has excelled himself because he's allowed me to live with this gorgeous classic Aston Martin to really get to know it and work out whether it could be the car for me. Unfortunately, I won't be buying this off him because he's decided it's going to be a keeper. And I've got to say, I do kind of get why. The origins of the Aston Martin V8 can be traced back to the 1960s. At the time, they had the DB6, which, though in Vantage guys, was putting out pretty decent numbers. Both the chassis and engine were outdated. More than that, though, for the price that Aston Martin were asking, it was likely becoming increasingly difficult to justify selling customers a six-cylinder car. You have to remember, both Ferrari and Lamborghini have been selling 12-cylinders for quite some time. There were no doubt rumours circulating also then that Jaguar were about to do the same, and in America, they'd been putting V8s in everything from milk floats to muscle cars for decades before. Polish engineer Tadek Marek had been Aston Martin's go-to engine guy since the 1940s, and he was given the task of constructing this all-new and very important power plant. The result was a 5.3-litre, four-cam shaft, fuel-injected V8 that saw service until 2000, in which time it became one of the most powerful engines in the world. However, it didn't get off to a brilliant start. In order to test the durability of the new engine, Aston Martin sent it off to Le Mans. But after 24 hours of running, when they stripped it apart to check it over, they realised it had suffered excessive and premature wear. So, having run out of time, in 1967 they launched the all-new-looking DBS with the very old six-cylinder. But because the new car was heavier than the old DB6, it was actually slower than the car it replaced. And as a result, people were not very impressed. It was two years later, in 1969, that eight-cylinder power finally arrived for Aston Martin. In the car, then rebranded the DBS V8. A few years later, both the six-cylinder and eventually the DBS name were dropped, leaving the car as just the Aston Martin V8. In 1973, we saw the introduction of the Series 3 car, which ditched the fuel injection they apparently could never get to work quite right in favour of carburettors. Another cited reason being, and from a perspective of 2023, this is difficult to believe, that was the only way they could get the car to pass US emissions legislation. How times change. In 1977, Aston Martin was once again staring down the barrel of bankruptcy and required a shot in the arm, which came in the form of the V8 Vantage. The Vantage name had been used several times before to denote a higher performance version of the standard model, and for the V8, it was no different. So the car got a more powerful version of the V8 engine, lower, stiffer suspension, and some subtle cosmetic tweaks too, including a very distinctive little rear lip at the back, initially bolted on, and more confusingly, at the front, where the cars had a bonnet scoop 
for the Series 3 and this intake here, those were closed off. I don't know why, but they like to do that back in the 1970s and uh, I'm sure it's entirely unrelated to British cars having a reputation for overheating. Then, a year later, in 1978, the car was revised in both V8 and Vantage form into the Series 4, otherwise known as the Oscar India, for October introduction. And there, haven't I just made that sound a lot less sexy? Oscar India is so much cooler when you don't know what it means. In any case, the changes were fairly comprehensive. Cosmetically, the car was altered both outside and in. So, the power scoop of the Series 3 became the power bulge, and the little tail that previously only the Vantage got became integrated into the bodywork and was made standard across the range, creating what I think is the sexiest looking muscle car, or maybe car, of all time. I know that there's lots and lots that I've missed out, but as I have to go and murder a man with a lawnmower, at this point in time, I'd like to invite all of you lovely Aston Anoraks to hop into the comment section below and tell me everything that I've either got wrong or missed out regarding the V8, the Vantage, Series 3, 4, and uh, just about anything else you'd like to tell me. Although I know you probably imagine this is what every single old Aston Martin feels like, actually that's not the case at all. And the Series 4 was in fact the first Aston Martin to feature a wood interior for decades. The car also features extensive use of both leather and top quality carpet mixed with that most classic of all British things, the cheapest switch gear you can possibly imagine. I have to give special mention to the dash, which features an epic selection of gauges. My favourites being the temperature dials for both oil and water, which you can tell are cold because when they are, they shiver. They sit there going, Ugh. Other things I really love, the fact the car has down here an almost inexplicable bevy of what looks like fuses, but actually are also switches, and they allow you to choose various different functions, including two types of horn. One that sounds fairly meaty, and one that sounds a, a little more dainty and sweet, taken apparently from a Maserati. The rest of it though really is business as usual. There's more space in here than you might expect, and I've got to say, it's been a great place to spend some time. These chairs in particular deserve special mention. They are some of the most comfortable I've ever known. Although, when you're sat in traffic and idling, that one rattles. The car shakes about so much, the whole thing just sits there going, which is not a good look, but I suppose you'd call it part of the charm. Same for this tiny steering wheel that looks awfully plastic and bakelite but is actually metal, and there are lots and lots of little details that as you spend longer with the car you do notice, like the fact the handbrake down here, when it's in, well, any position, gets in the way of your leg, the brake pedal that is clearly so meaty it has two supports, and the fact that the steering column has been mounted on the wonk. I love the clock, I appreciate the fact that it has electric windows, particularly as in this car, the HVAC has given up entirely. Apparently, it worked until Hull. <laughs> Same really goes for the speakers. They were mostly working and then I went over a bump and they stopped working. But a couple of miles later, I went over another bump and that fixed them. Over time, the 5,340cc Aston Martin V8 did receive a number of upgrades, including for the fifth series, a return to fuel injection. And though the owner's manual for this car is keen to give you the most specific of details about this, including valve clearances and the torque settings for every single bolt, the one thing it doesn't tell you is how much power or torque the thing actually makes. In fact, as far as I'm aware, during the entirety of the V8's life, Aston Martin never owned up to just how powerful they thought it really was. Figures vary from anything from about 300 odd horsepower for the standard V8 up to over 400 for the Vantage, down to as low as just over 200 for the American market emissions control cars. Torque for this particular car is estimated at around 350 pound foot. They sound absolutely fine. Unfortunately for me, the bigger problem is what that engine is connected to. Here, and it's the same for many V8s, you have a three-speed Chrysler Torque Flight Automatic. There was also the option of a five-speed ZF manual, but the popularity of the auto, I'm sure, has nothing to do with the fact that it was considerably cheaper. Because Aston Martin could buy those for £150 versus £1,500 for the ZF, the V8 Auto actually retailed for slightly less, 
the manual was just over £51,000, and these were £49,995. And as you'll see when we take it out on the road, that is a tragedy, because as far as I'm concerned, that gearbox ruins any potential that this engine ever had. And though 49995 might sound like a bargain price for an Aston Martin today, you have to remember, this was 1985, and back then, 49995 for a car was a lot of money. But then, I suppose it had to be, because these were still very much handmade. All of these panels were formed into shape by men with hammers and moustaches. To give you some context, it's the modern-day equivalent of £144,000, which also doesn't sound like an awful lot. But to give you a little more context, that was only about £5,000 less than the V12 Lamborghini Countach. It was £10,000 more than a 911 Turbo, and it was double, and then some, a Lotus Turbo Esprit. In fact, for the price of this, you could have had yourself an Audi Quattro and a Lotus Turbo Esprit, and enough change left over to buy yourself a cooking Ford Fiesta to take to the shops in the week. Maybe that's why, in eight years, they sold just 291 of them. Yeah. So that, in a nutshell, is the car. But what's it like to drive? What you really need to understand about this car, in order to give it any credit at all, is that though it may have been sold in the 1980s, it was designed in the 1960s. Not only does it have carburettors, it's still got a manual choke on a car that cost nearly the same as a Countach. And in terms of performance, though they may have claimed very good numbers, 6.6 .6 to 60 and a top speed of 140, I would view those with a very, very large pinch of salt. Sort of barrel, really. You see, I've driven many of this car's contemporaries, Countach, Testarossa, the Quattro, Lotus Turbo Esprit, Porsche 928, and just about every single one of them would absolutely run rings around this car. I'm really not exaggerating. Even worse than that, not only does this have the performance to match a smart car with a limp, it drinks like a top fuel dragster. Guy reckons the economy here is somewhere in the region of 11 and a half. And in my experience, I would say he's probably right. When you fill it up and you've got two lovely big fillers at the back to do that, it will only ever say it's got three quarters of a tank that I can put up with. That's an old British car quirk. What I can't is how quickly it gets rid of that so-called three quarters of a tank. 200 miles I did driving this car home at 70 mile an hour and it cost 85 pounds. Ouch. You do still have to put lead additive in it and of course super unleaded is the only fuel to use. I've been trying where I can to get SOs because theirs is mostly, I think, ethanol free. Now, I'm sure quite a few of you out there are currently sat there thinking, James, 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 you're doing the thing you always do. You're judging the car by the standards of today rather than the standards of its day. This was a quick car way back when. We know so. The numbers say so. All right, then. Let me demonstrate to you just how quick this Aston Martin V8 is. I've got a nice clear bit of road, nothing behind me. My friend Anthony down there ahead of me. I'm at not mile an hour, I'm going to put my foot all the way down. Okay, that's 10, that's 20, 30, we're in second gear now. Uh, there's our 45, foot still down. I know we're in a bend and we're about to go uphill, but that's 50. That's an indicated 60, which I know is not a real 60. That was foot flat the entire way. Oh, if you think, James, you're being silly because you're using the automatic gearbox and letting it sit in drive and therefore change when it wants to, put it in the manual mode and it'll make a difference. No, it doesn't. It revs more, sounds a little bit better, but uh, it doesn't really go any quicker. That's foot flat, first gear, foot flat. <laughs> 
But there is another side to this because very quickly you then forget about the fact it isn't all that quick and it does allow you to push on a little bit more, put your foot down a little bit more, get the sample, the handling and I'll talk about that in a minute but before I even get to that there's one thing about this car that's going to divide opinion entirely and when I say it you'll either go yeah that's the car for me or no can't be dealing with that. This is a car that's all about the ritual of driving. There are four pages in the handbook alone dedicated to how you get the car started. When it's hot, when it's cold, when it's Tuesday. The thing has character and though it may be the character of a grumpy old man, in many ways it's the character of your favourite granddad. You know the one who's a little bit crotchety in the mornings but you'd be absolutely devastated if you were to misplace him. I got home with this and my girlfriend said to me, oh go and take a shower you stink of petrol and leather and I went yeah it's great isn't it? She disagreed. I personally would like to bottle this because I think it sounds fantastic. She did however in her defence also say this was the prettiest car I have ever brought home. There's just something about this that I think unites nearly everybody. I know it's the DB5, which is the golden boy of the Aston Martin world, but I've never actually been that big a fan of the way that they look. They don't really mean all that much to me. These though, I think are so, so cool. The Vantage does have a few specific changes, including a little air dam at the front that gives it a little bit more aggression, wider wheels and tyres too. This has two 3.5s all round, I think that got two 7.5s at the back. In all fairness, this is really all this needs. Comically large profile too, they're 70 section wide, they look like van tyres, but somehow it does just look right. Aston Martin's designers did later admit that the Mustang was certainly an influence and you can really see that particularly in the sort of back half of the car, that little flip up tail and I've got to say this to me is the definitive British muscle car. Many have called it, particularly the Vantage over the years, a supercar but to me a supercar's got to have the engine in the middle, it really really does. Now this is tricky. Thank you. Now, you see, there we go. Demonstrated at once the good and the bad of this car. It's very wide, it's very difficult, hard to get through spaces, but the people that are blocking your way will love you. I've had many workmen, in fact, he's one of many people with high-vis jackets that have come up to the car and gone, yeah, I like that. And I mean, why wouldn't you? It's just gorgeous, particularly in this absolutely stunning shade of the green over the cream with the wood, this is epic and simply put from here right now on a road like this at these speeds in traffic I'm having a great time yes I've got the windows down because otherwise I will roast to death and I apologize for the extra wind noise but were I in a Vantage would it feel any different mm, probably not really might be a little firmer which I don't think I'd actually want this has still got a kind of edge of crashiness to it the ride isn't particularly sophisticated nor is the suspension it is fully independent at the front but the rear is a De Dion tube with a Watts linkage which I think I actually recently criticized the uh, Ford Mustang for having still in 2005 but uh, I suppose the Aston coming from the 1960s it's a little more forgivable Aston's literature of the time would have you believe that the Vantage in particular has handling that equals any of that barring the sportiest of race cars. Maybe a little bit, little bit over optimistic on that one Aston. All right, here we go. Come on, that's locked in first. Now I'll let it change a second. And you know what? It actually will go around a bend much better than I thought it would. I drove this car very, very briefly a few months back and I think it was on old tires then because, well, it handled like an ungainly, overweight Capri. Wasn't that enjoyable. It's much better now. All right, windows up. For your sake as well as mine. On a cruise, it's actually delightful. Once I got used to the fact that when warm, the carburetors will pop. You sort of drive along and it goes And that's a bit disturbing, but I was forewarned about it. However, once you realize that's just what it does, it's not actually anywhere near as terrifying as you think and I've got to say there are other things that actually are genuinely just good about the car including 
the brakes. The normal thing for old cars is that they go quite well, but they do not stop. This is actually the opposite. Doesn't want to go at all, but stops really, really well. In fact, let me demonstrate, because we've got a corner coming up, so I might as well share for some speed. 50-40, there you go. And I did not have my foot all the way down. I haven't locked the tires up yet, and I'm sure the fact it's nice, dry, sunny, warm, and the rubber is fresh has a lot to do with that. The car, of course, doesn't have ABS, traction or stability control or anything of the sort, but I do feel relatively confident driving it. I can't imagine how big this must have felt back in the day. I mean, by today's standards, it's not a small car. However, back in the 60s and even the 80s, it must have felt huge. It's got a real presence about it, this. And when you see it coming down the road, there's just something magic about it. And it's all little things like that that sort of make the fact that um, you'd probably get out dragged by a rather keen cyclist kind of melt into the background. So I've hinted at what the handling is like, in other words, better than I expected, but the steering specifically, I wanna talk about that, cause it's bizarre. The car does have power steering, but half the time you wouldn't believe it because it's very, very heavy. In fact, some of the heaviest in any car I've experienced. Usually with these things, as you do get a little bit of speed on, they will become nice and light and actually they're not that bad. This though, oh, no, this is meaty and chunky all the time. What I think is happening is that when you're in a straight line, those big profile tires just do not want to deviate from their course. There's a lot of resistance. Once they're actually turning, it's not anywhere near that bad. The effort required seems to diminish greatly, but until that point, it really fights you. Okay, turning circle, let's give that a test because it's probably not going to be very good. Oh, actually, is it is it horrendous? I mean, it, it's not good, I'll be honest. It's not good, blocking the road. Let's not try and make a habit of that. And, uh, Oh no, we are in drive. Okay, right, and uh, foot down again. Tally ho! I did give the manual a thorough read because I was getting very frustrated with this gearbox, and it allegedly is semi smart, but the fact is, by just about any modern standard, it's thick as two short planks. It changes up at set intervals, and remember, there are only the three ratios. Then if you somehow activate kick down, it'll only go into the gear it thinks that's appropriate, and when there's only three to choose from, basically that means if you're lucky, maybe it'll go from third to second, but second is already quite long anyway, so don't really expect a miracle. I've driven a number of old Jaguars with the magnificent V12 that they did and the three-speed auto, and I've driven the same engine in cars with a five-speed manual. The difference is night and day. It opens up the engine. It feels like it's gained another 200 horsepower. I really, really would like to try one of these with a manual in to see what a difference it makes. And I know Guy is considering perhaps putting a manual into this car. Some people I'm sure, sorry, the window's got to open. Some people I know would consider something like that sacrilege, but actually, I think it's exactly the right thing to do because if you talk to anybody that owned a car like this back in the day, modifying them, changing them, getting them to your specification, it's what you did. And in fact, Aston have done that even in modern times as well. So when the Vanquish came out and nobody liked its robotized manual gearbox, Works offered a service to convert it to a manual. And actually, these days, those are the cars sometimes most highly valued. I don't really see any reason why this would be any different. There's nothing on the dash to indicate which gearbox you have, so um, just change it, do a good job of it, and I think the car will likely be better for it. Had you asked me at the start of this week whether I thought that would have been a good idea, I would have almost certainly said no. No point, the performance is rubbish, just don't bother, it won't go around a bend. But now I know that it actually will go around a bend somewhat keenly, I think putting a manual in will just give you a little bit more control of the car and let you enjoy that engine a little bit more. That, I think, is my greatest frustration. All this gearbox wants to do is hold that engine between two and two and a half thousand RPM. That's it. If you didn't use the sort of semi-manual selection mode down here, you'd never hear it at anything above three, full stop. And that's a shame because it's probably a decent engine. I just can't tell through the murk that is this horrid old gearbox. 
I must also say, when you open the engine bay for the first time, the sheer size of the lump up there, it's just staggering. The crankcase is enormous. Reminds me of the lump you'd get on a Chieftain. It's vast. I don't really know how they made it quite so big, but they have. And hilariously, when you're at a stop, the thing idles in quite a sort of lumpy way, so you'd be paused and it's just doing that kind of thing, you know, bouncing the moves about the place. It's not very flattering sometimes, this car. It really isn't. That's foot welded, absolutely pinned, and I think that A4 is getting away. Oh, no, am I reeling him in? Oh, yes. <sighs> oh, my life. In the time that I've had it, it has been mostly reliable, although one small issue has developed, and I'd say this is probably a good example of the sort of thing you'd have to deal with when you own a car like this. I noticed that the interior lights were stuck on, and that was particularly noticeable because before they had been stuck off. The little pin down here that detects whether the door is open or not is slightly out of alignment with the striker that's supposed to close it, meaning the car thinks the door is open all the time. We have sellotaped a packet of tissues to it so it sort of closes it and does the job. Simple problems, simple solutions and all that. Let's go. This is the problem. I mean, I got to 50 there before I let it change in first, and it was only at 4,000 RPM. The rev limit is just over six. The box is crippling this car. Visibility is excellent, at least, because you've got paper-thin A pillars. The B pillars are way back there and also essentially non-existent, and uh, there's loads of glass in the thing. Space inside is pretty good. You will get people in the back, and the boot's not a bad size either, although it is a slightly odd shape. Even though I've begun to get used to it, I'm still treating it with quite a bit of respect when it comes to throwing it around a bend, because ultimately it's still a near two-ton car with very small tyres and probably a lot of weight on the front. I've noticed several times that they look a little less inflated up there than they do back there. However, I am grateful to the brakes for being as good as they are. What I suppose is most incredible about this car is one of the reasons I've never really taken them all that seriously as a purchase proposition is because I've always assumed they're just going to be ruinous to run. Even by Ferrari standards, I figured an old Aston Martin is going to be all sorts of trouble. But this one actually hasn't been, and when you consider the fact it was essentially laid up for over a decade, that's incredible. When Guy bought this car, I believe it hadn't turned over, or at least driven, for 11 years. He gave it to his trusted mechanic, not an Aston Martin specialist, instead someone he uses for his rally cars, and he gave it a good once over and said, well, what I think it really needs is a thorough service. So he did that, drove it for a little bit, noticed there were some issues with the suspension, particularly the car sort of listing to port, as it were, so the suspension was then refreshed, everything replaced essentially, and um, it didn't fix the problem at all. Might have improved the handling a little bit, but I didn't really drive it much before to say. And all of that, to date, has cost less than £5,000, which I think is really rather good. Recommissioning and tarting up the Z3 that I had was only a little bit cheaper, and granted there were cosmetic things I did to that, and this car does need some cosmetic attention, but I actually think that's not all that bad. I believe now I could probably run one of these things. Do I want to, though? That is the million dollar question, or more accurately, the hundred thousand pound question, because that's probably what you're going to spend to get into one of these. Vantage prices of late have gone crazy. There were sort of quarter million to 300,000, and there are still a couple at that price, but there are also some at 350, 375, and some being POA. I hate POA on principle, because as far as I'm concerned, it's essentially a way of the dealer trying to hide from both customer and seller exactly how much money you're talking about, and that just, that just isn't a good thing. In any case, I've really really enjoyed my time with one of these and I think maybe one day I would have one but I need to try a manual if someone out there has one or indeed any old school cool unusual interesting Aston Martin and they're willing to get it on the channel I would love 
to hear from you. My email address is talk at jm.com. It's in every description of every video because I do need to see whether putting a manual in here is going to have the difference that I hope and I think I would need it too because right about now so much of this car really appeals to the old school driver in me but that box is killing it. And so actually this week has not been anywhere near the disaster that I thought. It's roasting hot out there and the temp gauge is barely at a third of the way along. In fact, it's a quarter of the way along. I'm impressed. And actually, one thing I will say for the Aston, compared to, say, your Capris and everything else of the day, this does feel solid. I mean, hewn from granite, everything in here is really, really hefty. Even if it comes off in your hand, it's really heavy to hold. I appreciate that, and I sort of get why it was that 291 people were convinced to buy an Aston Martin V8, but I also do now get why only 291 people could be convinced. Anyway, I want to say a huge thanks to Guy for lending me this car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.